Tim, hi. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Hi, Tim. All right. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, very very good. It's people. I'm just making myself a, a drink. One second. So you're going to talk about flea beetle today then, Tim? Yeah, I can be touch on it, yeah. Have you uh, got any revolutionary <laughs> bits to talk about? Or is it all just all my normal? Uh, just, just what I do to avoid flea beetle. <laughs> Yes, it is. It is actually revolutionary, Matt. Uh, we're actually building these tiny little guillotines. We're going to be chopping their heads off. <laughs> oh, why not feed it to a predator? Uh, we'll hire the predator to chop their heads off, and then. Sorry, How are your rapes looking this year, Tim? Looking very well. Everything's looking very well. Good. Have your rapes gone backwards a little bit since? Uh... The frost and that? No, they're, they're growing away nicely now. They're in green bud, so uh, yeah, they're moving forward. Okay. Good thing, good thing that social wow. justice warriors don't don't listen to farmer conversations talking about oil seed rape when they just use the last word out of the three. I try, I try to use canola. <laughs> yeah, canola's no, probably that's, the safest no, that's, way. That's it's got me in trouble before, Daniel. <laughs> Canola's too, too, too American. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question before we get started? So, with soil health and this uh, idea that we want to be trying to push towards uh, fungi to bacteria ratio one to one, how does that fit in with all seed rape? Been a brassica. It, it it doesn't fit very well, but it doesn't worry me. I mean, some of my headlands now, I can't grow all seed rape. The, the, it's too much fungi, and it just it doesn't matter how many times you drill it. It just doesn't grow. It's just the wrong environment. So That's I think good. probably in time, I will just drop all seed rape and grow something else. Um, yeah, it doesn't and worry. Why me. your headlands are so good, Ma Matthew? It's, Matthew. I'll, if I can actually, if I can actually help with there, there's there's actually studies showing that um, the brassicas are quite happy with with fungal fungi in the soil. It's that um, um, they they simply don't don't have mycorrhizal connections. They they actually they actually are you know happy if they have some fungi. And so the thing is that um, there is it's it's like a wide range, and there could be many different aspects as well. Um, we did a little trial of weeds basically in uh, in pots with different fungal to bacterial biomass ratio and these weeds were growing up until three to one fungal to bacterial biomass ratio they were not happy at three to one but they were growing and they only they only barely germinated at 16 to one so your brassicas are going to be fine yeah. they still interact yeah, quite well with saprophotic fungi it's like as daniel said it's just the mycorrhizae but I have got areas now where I just can't grow it, Matt. It just it doesn't matter how I've drilled it three times, it just won't, won't germinate. It's, no. It's only on deadlands. And it's it's only and about three to six meters width. But uh, it doesn't worry me because I say I'll just grow something else. And the headlands then are better because oh in terms of soil. It's just that all the trees are there. So I I just presume that you know there is a lot more fungal there. I've got plenty of fields of two to one fungi. Uh, fungi is a bacteria and the rape's perfectly happy at that. Uh, it's when it gets higher, like Daniel was just saying. Um, and the, the headlands, some of the, it's only little strips, but it's just where it's just become so dominant. I just cannot grow all the seed right there. I've given up. Tim, I've, I've got one question. I know you use I know you use the microscope to assess, but do you use the uh, the microscope to do your, to your fungal bacterial biomass ratio counting or do you use uh, the cell microbiometer? I, I do both, Daniel, because I don't trust the biometer. It's, it's a good guide to see patterns, but I don't trust it. Okay, so, I so, do both. so you do your normal uh, counts. I don't, if I'm totally honest, I don't do as much as I'd like anymore because I'm too busy doing talks and showing people around the farm and I run out of time, basically. Mm, such <laughs> yeah. a big man. I'm too no, busy myself. Not at all. 
I get I get basically I get basically distracted by by basically you know trying to um to get investment on board half of the time then and and I can't you know I've I've got the microscope on my desk and it's it's Adam over there that basically does all the scoping for for us now. It's they just oh, you know you can totally understand that there's just not enough hours in the day. It doesn't matter how yeah. hard I work. It's I just can't do everything and the microscope is the one that I want to do more of but i don't have time it's uh, it really annoys me have you upgraded over that swift yet no <laughs> come on I keep it just to annoy you thank you it's been three years or something it's been enough to get yeah. yourself a better one <laughs> it still That's makes me not on it. seeing you suffer with it it's all coming up thank now you. <laughs> How are you, Adam? All good, thank you, mate. Yeah, looking forward to this. I have to, I have to admit, you know, the the thing is, it, it was a, it was a very positive experience for me because now I tell everybody who's asking which microscope to buy, don't have a Swift. Never ever. <laughs> I've bought on. I've bought on your recommendation anyway, uh, Daniel. Amscope needs to tell, needs to start paying me money, basically. You need to be on commission, Daniel. That's it. I'm missing out here. Millions and you millions are. and millions. Hello, Judith. Good to see you. If you can hear me. Can Judith hear me? Why is my phone ringing again? Judith can't hear us, I think. She's got no sound. She's just... Um, oh, I see. Her. Gotcha. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just texting my wife because she's on the plane soon. Tim, do you add compost or uh, biocomplete compost? Or is it just the way you farm biologically, you think you're so improving? All the above, I would say, Matt. It's I, I make compost and I put uh, I grew compost yeah. up, so I put a lot of compost down. But you've got to have a, a healthy working soil for the compost to work, I think, properly. You know, unless you know, you've got to be keeping improving. So I think what I always say, where I've got to, you've got to earn the right to get to where I am, and you can't just do it overnight. It takes time, and it's a lot of oh, work. Absolutely. Not free, yeah. but it takes work. Yeah, absolutely. And you're compost. learning how to make. Sorry. Compost is everything. So I, I keep playing in different recipes, but I keep playing with compost. But I still believe compost to be everything. We've killed all those microbes for so long. They're not just going to come back in my mind. You know, a lot of people keep saying, oh, all you need to do is add air and everything's going to come back. Well, I, I just don't believe that. It's Our own stomachs don't work like that. If we haven't got the right microbes, we have to reintroduce them. And I just right, think so. soil's the same. And that's, that's my belief. So, yeah. We put too many poisons out for too long, in my opinion. So are you still how long have you been doing that? Um, gosh, I've been playing around with biology for, for probably 11 years, um, compost-wise. Oh, probably the last five, five years compost. I used a consortium of, of different bacteria and fungi before then until I got myself up to a stage where I was comfortable making the compost brews. I was sort of, well, eight, nine years ago, I was often doing compost teas. Then I got a bit scared when I realised that you could put, um, <laughs> um, I can't think of the bloody name of it now. You could put some nasties out there. Pathogens. disease and such like. So um, I, I, I lost faith a little bit in my ability. So I went to, to known microbes that are buying a consortium of microbes. And then the last last five years, I've just been making compost and making the compost compost teas and extracts and putting onto the as I drill. What's your what's your base compost built from? I mean, what what's your base materials that you use? Um, I use use a lot of horse manure because I, I I make haylage for horses, so it's my haylage coming back and it's my straw coming back. 
So I'm quite happy to use that. And then I, I, I incorporate uh, wood chip and leaf mold and I'll, I'll put some humic acid, some vermicompost, some, some basalt rock dust in there. I, I play around with lots of different recipes to see what I can come up with, really. it's um, I wouldn't say there's any scientific rhyme or reason to what I do. I just play around with different recipes. Until where I did you come up? Where did you come up with the idea of using of using rock dust in compost? Um, how did I come up? It's a guy called uh, Mick Putney. He calls himself the Compost King. He's a, quite a well known horticulturalist, and he was the one that put me onto that. I think originally, and that okay. was just we were sat together at um, a compost tea day, and we were just chatting about compost. Because we put it. And, we and, use it too. Um, where do you get your like? indigenous microbes from if you're if that's what you're using as an inoculant do you go to I, woodland or i if if i'm using a consortium i buy the microbes in so i buy them in from ava fertilizer um other than that I, I, originally when i first started making my compost i took soil from out the woodland and under hedgerows and just mixed it in just so I could add as much as I want could. And then I always save some of my compost and add it to the next compost if I like yeah. it. And I just keep doing it that way, basically. Right. Yeah, the woodland yeah. woodland trips are basically like a like a start of, of, of any healthy compost operation. Because the thing is that hot composting, especially, you know, not, not static composting, but hot composting, that's your way to reduce pathogen load, but it's actually reduce anything load. So it's it actually brings down the um, the numbers of all organisms. So then you can put in stuff that you want to grow out. So you do the hot composting first, and then add your woodland or your the biology that you actually when you when want you first when you first when you first starting out when you when you're first starting out you can you can do that. Um, when you when you're starting off with a you know with a basically a um, you know a first compost pile kind of thing, but you can you can do it in other ways. You can have a wood chip pile that's wet outside, and you can just keep putting things in it as you go for walks, basically. So you can just keep it going like that, and then th that material goes into your pile when you're doing composting, and then somehow they find a way through. Um, and then once you sort of get it, you know, a few compost piles rolling, then that material is partially your starting material for your next pile and your next pile. So then so then you keep you keep regrowing your own microbes that way. That's exactly how I do it. Are you are you Johnson Sue or do you do thermothelic as well then? Um I I just I do it more the old Victorian way. So I just have a a, a sort of a one foot by a meter square. I didn't get on too well with the Johnson Sue. When I did it, the top was a bit too wet and the bottom was a bit too dry and I wasn't happy with it. So I like to be able to control the whole environment of the compost. And by having a um, like a 12 inch meter square of an IBC with all the plastic taken out, so I still keep the bars. I line that with Hesse and Saki and then I can just control that atmosphere, what's going on. If it needs turning, I can turn it. If it's a bit dry or a bit wet, I can just control it. And that I, I make some lovely compost now where the Johnson so I think it's brilliant, but it's I find it hard work. You, you've got to devise a way that you can take all the mesh off and be able to shovel it out because making a cage is difficult to get in and shovel it out. Where the way I make it now in a square uh, of a foot, it's easy to shovel out, it's easy to monitor, it's easy to keep to add things if I want to. I just can keep control over it, which works really, really well for me. And so, that goes for a year, then does it? Yeah. Cheers. And do you do you monitor the microbiology in that at any point? Do you actually have a look at the fungal bacterial ratios and all that kind of stuff? As long as I was just chatting to Daniel before, as long as I get a chance, I put it under the microscope because I love monitoring it and seeing what's going on. And my biological brews, I, I put them under the microscope. Um, time is never on my side, so I, I'm probably not doing as much as I'd like at the moment because I just I've mm -hmm. risen up hours in the day. It's as simple as that. I do lots and lots of talks now, and there's lots and lots of people want to come around the farm, and it just takes time up. And I think the one word I haven't learned is no. What I just keep to, I just trying to help people. So it's called I'm diversification. Very, very yeah. So where are you based? I'm just north of Wolverhampton. Right. Okay. A long way south of Carlisle, then. Yes. <laughs> Share a card, you know. a lot of things there. Oh, hey, Charlie! 
What are you doing here? No, well, I pop up. I haven't seen you here before. No, I was here last week. You weren't. Uh, Well, I've missed a few weeks, but um, yeah, I've been a regular until, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Good to see you. (laughs) No, well, um, Daniel's quietly converting me. (laughs) It's been fun. Right, so good. We've, um, I think, you know, we've Good to have some in. company in the future. What was that? I missed that. Sorry, Judith, I missed that. Good to have some company in Dumfrieshire. Yes, yes, definitely. I'll come and see you sometime. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. What were you saying, Daniel, before we, you were so rudely interrupted? So rudely. I was just basically saying um, six minutes in now, um, a few people have, have joined us. Um, I presume there's going to be a few more people joining us as we go along. Um, we had a nice soft introduction. A lot of people know who Tim is. Um, uh, but very quickly, Tim, do you want to introduce yourself? And then we can move on to uh, talking about Aussie uh, rape. Well, but, I mean, we can, we can just, I mean, I'll put, put some slides together, Daniel. So I was going to just introduce and show why I do what I do and just, do a bit of a journey. Um, you know, if, you, if it's boring, you just tell me to skip and I'll skip over. But that's what I was going to introduce, just to int- bring it up to where I get to, to where I am, if that works. That's, that's fine. Um, stage is yours. You can share the screen whenever you're ready. Okay. okay. These these conversations, Tim, you know, these, these weekly conversations we got, we, we've got, um, they're very loose conversations around biology, regenerative agriculture. <clears throat> when people get too excited, they start talking about politics, but then we cut them off and um, and we move on to uh, to do something more interesting. <laughs> but um, but then so we we don't have a lot of structure to it um, unless we do have a guest uh, when we want to you know talk about something that's um, that could be valuable to the rest of the group. So okay, um, I know. Say I'll- we, you know, let's just, just keep it informal. Then I'll go through the slides. We haven't got to talk about them all. I can just, you know, we can keep chatting as much as we want on whatever. It's uh... awesome. Uh, we definitely would like to. We'd like to hear, you know, your your way of looking after all seed rain because I think, yeah, I well, think I've, a lot I've, of farmers I've, are I've, struggling. I've done a lot of slides on that, so I have focused more on that, Daniel, because that was the brief you gave me. So awesome. I have done quite a bit on that. To show you how I get to to the way I do with all seed rape and that. So. Uh, Go for it. So I'm farm manager at Brood Park Farm. We're a 300 hectare farm, um, South Staffordshire, just north of Wolverhampton. I'm 50-50 winter to spring cropping. So every field on the farm will have a cover crop on it at some point in a 12 month period. Um, I'm, I'm, cover crops are at the heart of what I do and, and getting all those roots and all those exudates going back into the soil is how I've really improved my soil. Um, when I started off on the journey, which was back in 2009, um, and then I really got into cover cropping in 2015, 14. I've got a local composting, council composting, which I just didn't like. It's full of plastic. It's, um, it's, it's an insult to call it compost in my mind. It's just dead organic matter. So I didn't really want that. There's no real livestock farms close by so I couldn't get my hands on manure to make compost so I went more into the cover cropping which has worked really well for me. Um, I grow milling wheats, um, winter all seed rape um, and then I grow spring malting barley, spring beans, spring lupins. Lupins are a fantastic product, they improve the soil so much because they, they release phosphorus and they also put nitrogen back into the soil so my wheats always do an extra ton to the hectare following lupins and they're a brilliant protein source and why we're always importing protein from all the way around the world when we can grow it here always baffles me um but it's always a chicken and egg scenario because the feed mills won't use lupins until there's a big acreage and the farmers won't grow it until the mills want it so we just keep battling on like that i also grow i've grass in the rotation for haylids because we're in quite an equine area being so close to wolverhampton I grow corn marigolds, um, corn flowers. I'm probably going to try some chamomile this time, uh, which I grow for seed, um, which adds even more biodiversity to the farm. I'm also in the mid-tier. I've been in the mid-tier since it started, and when the mid-tier came out, it was just fantastic for me because I could protect all my waterways. I've got all the corridors 
to get my natural predators getting all the way around the farm. Um, and I'd got my pollinators. So it was, it was almost written for what I wanted to do. And obviously they were going to pay me for my cover crops as well. So and at the time they were telling everybody that not many people would get in and everybody thought it was too complicated. So I just rubbed my hands and thought, yeah, this is going to work really well. And I just sailed in there. Um, just, I always put this in because soil is so precious. Um, and I know I'm talking to the converted here today, but this is back in 2012 and 64 acres of soil lost in six days. And we cannot keep doing that to the planet in which we live. There is no planet B. This is all we've got. And to let that soil go out and block all our estuaries up, take all those nutrients with it, it's just madness. And I can remember as a boy, we'd laugh at something like that when we were here, we'd plow a field and you'd see all the river turn brown from it and we found it funny. And well, I, no, I couldn't understand it at the time, but it, that's all our nutrients and the bank going off the farm. Um, and, we, you know, we can't keep doing that. It's, um, there is no planet B, this is all we've got. That soil obviously goes off and blocks all our estuaries. And from there, it's going into our oceans, which create all our dead zones. 70 to 90% of the oxygen we breathe comes from marine photosynthesis. What we're going to do, wait until we can't breathe. We've got to stop polluting the world. And I say, I know I'm talking to the converted today, but it's such a big issue. And the more we can all talk about it, the better and the faster we can move forward in my mind. And soil is everything. It gives us food, it gives us clean water, it gives us air. It's, um, it's, it's the, the lifeblood of our, of our lives. It's such a finite resource and we've got to look after it. In 2009, I started the declader drill, which, which worked really well. Um, it was probably the, the best thing was it, it let me come into direct drilling and start to understand it. Because back then I, probably, I couldn't have gone from, a, from a, a tillage system. We were in a min till system. I couldn't have gone from that into a no-tillage system. It would be too much for my brain. And I do consulting and I help people all around the world with direct drilling. And the one thing that's always the biggest block is always what's between these two things. That's always the hardest thing to get people over. Um, and most farmers, I find, learn visually and they just have to see how the crop is and how everything works. But that's always the biggest block is, is the per farmer themselves. In 2015, I, I bought a 750. Um, and I knew then that I wanted to start farming with biology. Biology's got all the answers. It's just us as not asked the right questions. Um, and so we got the 750 and I got to adapt it because I wanted to get that biology right in the rhizosphere next to the seed. There wasn't anything on the market that would do that. So I had to, um, had to develop a system. I worked closely with a guy called Trevor Tapping who came up with the, the idea of the liquid system. I developed a pipe that would drop the liquid right in the rhizosphere on top of the seed, um, which was probably the hardest thing because there was loads of systems hanging it off the closing wheel at the back of the drill, but there was nothing that put it right in the rhizosphere. And, and that made me think, and I, I had to make it work. Obviously, I'm a manager here, I'm, so I'd, I'd said the system would work, and I'd got to make it work. And when you've got to make something work, it doesn't half make you focus. Um, so we did that. Uh, I'd been playing around with uh, biology since 2012. I, I read a book by Neil Kinsey, Hands on Agronomy, and I was just fascinated by nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, I met Mike Harrington in 2012. He was the first guy that actually understood what I was on about and where I wanted to go. And he'd actually got some nitrogen fixing bacteria. I wasn't brewing back then, I was just using the, the microbes as they are. Um, and so in order to pay for the microbes, I reduced nitrogen by 40 kilos to the hectare. And everywhere I'd use the microbes, I've got an extra ton of wheat. And I just went, wow, we're onto something here. Uh, the year after I did the same thing and I got exactly the same yield, but I still knew that the, the biology was, was the way forward for me. Um, so I've got the, the liquid tank on there. At the time, we used a diaphragm pump. Um, and I'll show you a picture of how I've changed that moving forward. I've got the front hopper there, which I can companion crop. I broach the seeds into the venturi of the drill, so I, I can companion crop with crops. I've got another broadcasting um, hopper at the back, so I can put white clover out, I can put boron granules out, whatever I want to do, I can do it. People often ask me, have I finished modifying the drill? And I don't know. It's, I've modified the drill to get over problems. I always think any problem, if we just think about it, we can get over the problem. You can't just give up at the first hurdle. That's my homemade brewer, um, just purely an IBC. 
I started off just with the air pump on top, so I've got a big air tube, so I'm always oxygenating the tank. Um, I'll add the microbes to it, add a food source such as molasses, um, and I'll brew up for 24 hours. As I got better at brewing, I started to think, well, everything um, reproduces better if the water's if in a warm environment, so I now heat the water to 18 degrees, and by doing that, I got three times better brew, the biofilm and everything else was, it just hangs like muscles in the tank there on a, I've got a string that holds the air pipe and that string will just be covered like muscles hanging off the string because it's just so much biofilm. I also broke, brew up um, for, for protozoa, um, bacteria is five to one carbon to uh, nitrogen. The protozoa obviously are just, just after the, more the carbon, they only want the one nitrogen, so they're spitting out that nitrogen. So I, I brew up protozoa and, and try to increase the protozoa on my soil. So always trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen that um, I'm brewing. I also use that brewer to brew up my compost extracts. It's another one that I've made myself. I've got a big air pillow in the bottom of that uh, basket that sits there. So it's forcing air up and forcing the microbes off the organic matter. And then I've got two air tubes either side of the, the, the IBC. So I'm constantly moving the water and oxygenating it, uh, which works really well for me. And then I've got another way that I extract um, compost. So I've, I've got a plaster of stirrer on a drill and I'll be really vigorous and knock the, 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 the spores off the, off the organic matter. And I'll put a compost extract out in the drill. It just depends what I'm trying to achieve and what I want to do really. But I'll have a go at pretty much anything that way. As I got better at brewing, the diaphragm pumps that we've got on the drill just couldn't cope with the biofilm. It was blocking my filters up sort of every 10, 15 minutes, which was driving me mad. So again, I give Trevor trapping problems and he gives me back solutions. And I told him my problems. I told him we couldn't carry on like that. And he developed a peristaltic pump for me. The peristaltic pump is just like a kidney dialysis machine. but It's a very gentle squeezing action on the biology. And I can pump a really dirty liquid through there now. and. Uh, it, I, I don't get blockages. I don't need to run a filter. It can just cope with it. As long as it's not large debris, it'll cope with anything. I can pump pure molasses through there. And it, no problem whatsoever. I've also got road cleaners on the drill. Uh, my combine doesn't spread the chaff very well. Um, so I was having problem with all the seed rate where the soil would go quite acidic with all the chaff breaking down. By fitting the road cleaners, which came from Australia, I just move a little narrow, sweep a little narrow pathway of straw and I get good seed to soil contact, which overcomes that problem, which is like I say, every problem can be overcome. We just need to think about it. So when I'm drilling, excuse me, I brewed up my microbes, so I add those to the drill. And then at drilling, I'll always have diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth <coughs> will then get converted by the plant into monosilicic acid, so I'm getting that silica level straight away high up in the plant. So I'm getting that cell wall strong right from day one to resist any pest and disease attack. I'll always put some humic acid down there because that's good for stimulating secondary metabolites, again, to get the natural antibiotics in the plant and getting everything um, protected. I'll put some salicylic acid down, which stimulates the plant to um, produce secondary metabolites as well and gets its own immune system. It's also a growth stimulant, um, which works really well for me. Bio plus T <clears throat> is a consortium mix of microbes that, again, I get from Ava fertilizer, which will have nitrogen fixing bacteria, phosphorus releasing bacteria. It'll have some trichoderma in there. Trichoderma is obviously the, the very aggressive fungi. So if there was any fusarium on my seed, the trichoderma would eat it. And then I'll also add my compost extracts in there. So this, um, <clears throat> when growing all seed rape, I'll always add magnesium, sulfur, molybdenum, boron, humic acid again. By doing that, I'm giving the plant the right nutrition right from day one so it can synthesize the sugars because the flea beetle is always attracted to monosilicic acid and, and monofructose. By me adding that right nutrition, the plant can convert that sugar into polyfructose, polysaccharoids. And once it gets converted into the polyform, that, that complicated sugar, the, the flea beetle can't digest it. It'll have a little nibble, but it just can't digest it. And that is how I get around the flea beetle. It's um, it's the, with the getting silica levels up to make that cell wall strong, but really getting these sugars that are being processed and, and put down as exudates, 
is just how nature intended it to do. It's um, it's releasing that sugar on a 24 hour period, and then the whole process starts again with photosynthesis. But I don't know whether my soil is short of that, and I can't test to know what's going on within that plant when it's at the seedling stage, which is why I just have the, the nutrition there right from day one with the drill, um, and it's worked really well for me. My neighbours have lost oil seed rape, and mine's always been fine. Uh, and I've got some more slides to show that as we go through the presentation. Now, how I can't prove any more that it, it, it doesn't work, if that makes sense. And that's just showing it. I always say if, if, if the nutrition isn't there in the plant, if, you know, if you put loads of nitrogen there, the plant's full of nitrogen, it's got all those mono, monosaccharides, monofructose, and it's just like having a big neon sign saying cafe open, and that flea beetle will see it from miles away because it's just a food source. Um, once the, the plant starts to, to actually synthesize those sugars, the flea beetle can't see it. I remember there was a lot of studies in the 70s when direct drilling was going on then, and they couldn't understand why aphids didn't attack the, the, the wheat and barley crops. And it's the same reason, because there wasn't the release of nitrogen from that mineralization of doing a cult cultivation, the plant was actually functioning far better. And that's why they weren't, weren't getting the, 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 the aphids attack back then, but they just didn't have the knowledge to understand why. And that's just again re-emphasizing it, but it's it's nature will always send in the bin men in my mind. If a plant isn't functioning properly, it's nature's way of taking that plant out because nature knows when a plant isn't functioning properly. Um, which which is what the flea beetle and aphids and, and even even um, fungal attacks are trying to do. They're taking an unhealthy plant out. Not a healthy plant will never get ill. If you've got the right nutrition balance in my mind. Just like we are, if we're healthily and, and balanced nutritionally, we won't get ill. It's as simple as that. And the plants are just exactly the same. Um, I really started out on this um, probably 15 years ago. Uh, my wife is big into nutrition and I had um, a problem with anxiety and depression. And she, she worked in mental health. She didn't want me to, to, to take any of the drugs. She said, you know, we can cure this by just getting your nutrition right. And I tested myself and sure enough, it took time. but I got myself better just by getting my nutrition right and keeping myself balanced. And that was my light bulb moment of if I can keep myself healthy by doing that, then I'll keep my plants healthy. Um, and it's always in my experience that it's the farmer that has caused the problem in the first place. It's uh, everything was working superbly well until human beings came along. Um, it's been developing for millions of years and all of a sudden the human race comes on and we'll take it from now. We know what we're doing. Um, and we didn't know what we were doing, but it's, it's no point trying to point the finger and blame people. We, you know, we're gaining knowledge. It's gaining ground now, and it's time to move forward and heal this planet in which we live. You know, I'm keep emphasising there is no planet B. This is all we've got. It's everybody's responsibility to demand food produced in this way so as we can improve the health of the planet, but improve the health of the population. Uh, nutrition is everything, and you are what you eat. There is no other way. You are what you eat. This is a picture of my grain store a couple of years ago. Um, I'd got a student helping me for that year from Harper Adams. Um, and we were combining the spring barley and the bar spring barley was just full of, of flea beetle. And I was drilling the all seed rape two days after and the student said, you, you've got to be mad, you can't drill into that. And I explained all the process about the sugars and he still couldn't believe it, but he still couldn't believe it when there was no attack on the all seed rape as it was growing. Once you get that plant functioning properly, the flea beetle just move on. And I've never seen flea beetle as bad as when I drilled that particular year. And the, the, as I was drilling, you could see the flea beetle moving all across the floor. It was just, even I was questioning myself, is this going to work this time? And it works superbly well. Uh, and I can't really do much more to prove that it works than that. It's, uh, the, it was a lie that year with flea beetle. And that they were marching out the grade still like an army. It was, um, it was unbelievable, but it's just all down to balanced nutrition and keeping the plant functioning as nature intended. Nitrogen is always is our best friend and our worst enemy. And um, I think nitrogen has probably done more harm to our soils than, than whatever the plough has. It's, it just burns the carbon out and puts soil backwards so far. And it's nobody's fault. It's time to understand that we don't need to use anywhere near the amount of nitrogen 
and keep that plant balanced. You know, we've got to have nitrogen in the system. Um, I try and fix as much as I can from the atmosphere, but I still step in and do foliar treatments just because I want maximum yield. I'm, uh, I'm not going for a low yield, I'm going for a high yield. Um, and I hate being called a low input farmer because if you say a low input farmer, people always have that impression in their head of a farm that's not being farmed to its full potential. Where I don't mind spending money, I want to get maximum yield, but I want to do it with as least spend as possible, but have the most healthy plant as possible. I always put calcium down um, as, um, as I was on drilling with liquid gypsum. Um, and calcium is king in my mind. It's a vastly underrated nutrient. Um, people judge calcium by pH. pH to me is irrelevant. pH is just potential hydrogen. It's nothing to do with calcium. Um, calcium is king. Without calcium, the plant will not function properly. It keeps that cell wall strong. Um, which is all part of my um, defense mechanism for every plant that I grow on the farm. But I always put liquid gypsum as I'm drilling. Um, and the benefits of calcium are just second to none. It's calcium is king and it's so overlooked. One second. Um, Niels, can you just mute, please? Because Daniel's gone and I can't mute you, but you're making loads of sound. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yeah. Cheers, man. Sorry, Tim. Okay. I wondered where it was coming from. <laughs> so calcium is the strength of all living things. Without calcium, plants are weak and open to attack. So let's say I always put liquid gypsum down. And I'll, the first year I did it, you could see it to the line where I'd applied liquid gypsum and where I hadn't. Um, everything I do, I trial before I roll it out on the farm. I never just, just do it on a whim. It's always been proven in my head. Um, and if something hasn't worked, I won't just dismiss it. I'll do another trial with it to make sure it's not going to work. Um, but trials, trials, trials. And I think if we all do trials and we all share what we're getting, we can all move this forward so much quicker. There's so much to learn. And we're, you know, we're only just starting out on the journey, all of us are. Again, calcium is king. Um, boron is the driver. Boron releases the exudates, as we know, in, in photosynthesis. And boron will decide where a lot of the, the elements go within the plant. But calcium is the carrier. Um, and I, again, I can't emphasize enough how important calcium is in, in the system, um, which is why I do so much sap testing, to always monitor the amount of calcium I've got there. Root development, without enough available calcium, root development will cease. Cell signaling, cell wall strength and cell division. Calcium is at all the stages of growth of that plant, which I say I, I always apply some um, calcium first at the start of the season. So I know there's going to be enough available calcium there. I always apply liquid gypsum as, as, I, as I'm drilling. And then I'll do failure calcium as and when regarding from my sap test to see whether I need more calcium. But calcium is so important in what I do. Um, I can't emphasize it enough. It always astounds me when you get a dairy producer and they don't even look at calcium. Um, and when I was growing up in the 70s, showing my age now, but milk was sold on calcium yummy. And cows, it's, it, they're just taking calcium out of the soil. And farmers just don't look at the, what the weeds, I don't like calling them weeds, but what the plants are telling them, because quite often they'll have a dot problem or a thistle problem. And that's just trying to pull calcium up, which is where your herbal lays come in. So important as a dairy farmer to release that calcium and bring it up. But calcium is everything. And as a dairy farmer, it astounds me how they, they don't give it any attention whatsoever when they, when they are basically mining so much calcium. I always refer back to Mulder's chart. I'd say I'll just drop this in there, but it is important. It's just showing that balance and it is balance. Everything I do is balancing that plant and, and all the way through development and not having any sudden surges of nitrogen or <coughs> anything else that'll be antagonistic to anything. So it's always little and often as I'm feeding the plant, but keeping that plant balanced as it's protected that it's always strong uh, and well-being. And um, I didn't say at the start, but I don't use pre-emergence herbicides. I don't use fungicides. I don't use insecticides. I don't use growth regulators. I obviously don't use any seed dressings. Um, I'm always trying to farm in the heartbeat of nature um, and, and farming at one with nature. And I'll always use the analogy. To, it's like the nursery line, merrily, merrily down the stream, life is but a dream. 
and it is if you're farming with nature you try and farm against nature and we've proved that with the last 70 years we've gone on with all these chemicals thinking we could batter and control mother nature and control the environment and we've lost the battle it, it, it's you know and we're losing it it's a drastic rate now the conventional farmers are because once you start paddling upstream it's bloody hard work and there's no need when you can just go with the flow and farm in the harmony of nature and have better yields in my experience and be making more money out of the farm and be a happier farmer in in what you're doing um, and in what you're giving back to the planet and improving that soil for generations to come because that's what every farmer wants to do true farmer is leave that soil in a better place than where we found it and i don't think there's anything more warming when i'm warming walking around the farm now and you see the wildlife you see all the biodiversity working you see the pollinators you can't help but smile at what you're doing and i think that has to be taken into account as a regenerative farmer because that smell from the soil, the acetonomycetes, you know, it's known to make the serotonin work in our brains and give us that feel good factor. And I'm still yet to meet an unhappy regen farmer unless they were just born a miserable bugger because there's nothing not to like. Um, everything just works as it should. Again, the synergism of calcium releases boron, releases silicon within the soil, they all work together. Silicon and calcium, you know, are two of my main things for, for that cell wall strength. And, Boron again is such a, a, a needed nutrient, which is often overlooked. Boron offers so much for us. Um, <clears throat> I am talking to the converted here today, but no calcium, low fungi. It's um, it all goes in on. You know, you need that 18, 24 percent air in the soil, and calcium lets that soil aerate. We we need that oxygen in the soil for anything to grow, and calcium again plays such a big part in that. And uh, I just always just wanted to drop it in how important calcium is. And again, I think I've probably spoken about most of that, but calcium is at the heart of everything. It helps infiltration rates, it helps the soil breathe, it helps with aggregation. Calcium is, is just key to a healthy soil, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. It helps with the germination of seeds. It's it's just at the heart, heart of, of everything, really, that I do calcium. It, I always companion crop um, up by all seed ray. Um, so I'll have bursine clover, crimson clover, and white clover. That works really well when I first started off with bursine clover. And every time the combine would hit it, I'd have 0.3 to 0.5 ton extra yield to the hectare. But the, the beauty of it now, it classes as my cover crop for the SFI. So I'm getting an extra income for doing what I was already doing, which again, it, it just works really well in the SFI. It's just a no-brainer for me because everything they're asking, I was already doing anyway. So I might as well have a, an income or be a small one from doing the SFI. So it works in really well. I do try and I take that clover right the way through to harvest, um, and and then I'll drill the wheat into it as well, um, which then I'll normally terminate it because I've got volunteers and a cover crop there. But it's still working all the way through, which is why I think I get the yield enhancement from using. The clovers where a lot, a lot of people have got in touch and they said, oh, I haven't, I haven't had any yield increase from my clovers. And I said, well, how long did you keep them? Well, I terminated them in January. Well, not me get the, in, in the yield increase because that clover hasn't had time to work and you haven't had that synergies of going on with the, 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 the all seed rape and the clovers to, to get that nutrition coming back in the form of the nitrogen. This um, is just showing the difference. So the, the picture on the left was my farm. This was just before Christmas. And you can see all that riser sheaf is working there. That, that riser sheaf is covered in soil. That plant is putting out exudates. I, I'm feeding the biology. I'm getting good interaction. The picture on the right was a friend of mine's farm um, who is a total conventional farmer. And I just, I, wherever I am, I always pull a plant up, see what's going on. And it just was unbelievable to pull that up and just have total bare roots. And it just shows that his system is a total drug addict system. There's no biology going on. Nothing's working there. And it, I found it quite hard, heartwarming to, to see mine. And I've, I've got such, such a good rise sheaf. You see all that aggregation around the soil. Um, and it's, again, you can see the system is working. That's just one bean plant in my cover crop. Um, and you can see the depth of that. You can see, again, the riser sheaf's covered in soil. That plant is functioning. It's healthy. It's, it's a good working system. 
I don't know whether we want to stop and have a chat about the Aussie grape or whether you just want me to carry on through. Adam, Daniel, whatever, it's, it's up to you. Well, Daniel's just had to leave, but um, yeah, we'll just crack on with you. I'd, okay. I'd love to come in and ask loads of questions, but um, I think <coughs> you're, you're on a roll. It's, yeah, it's okay. very interesting. No problem. So that particular cover crop, it's beans, veg and rye. Um, the reason I've got the rye in there, when I was just growing beans and veg, as like this year, I had some really hard frosts. I lost all the, all the, the, the beans in November and I lost all the nitrogen. So the rye is there just to soak up that available nitrogen and keep it going until I drill my spring barley, um, which, which seems to work for me. It is working well, but I love that picture of the bean plant. You know, I've got the depth of root in there. That's doing all my cultivation for me. The, the plant is feeding all that biology in the soil. It's just, just, just how the system should be working. It's just fantastic. I will reduce the cover crop with sheep sometimes. If I reduce with sheep, Always leave a third of that cover crop because then you're keeping the root mass and, and the, the plants recover far quickly. Um, so feed the below ground livestock as well as feeding the livestock on the top. Uh, and that's just a picture of that same field being reduced, but not, not taking it down and destroying everything. It's, uh, it's feeding below ground as well as above ground. Another favorite way of mine of destroying the cover crop, I don't know if it will work. No, it won't work. Um, another favourite way is to roll. I get up at three o'clock in the morning when it's minus four and below after consecutive nights frost. Um, and then if it's minus four and below, that cover crop just shatters like glass. It breaks it up into tiny, nice little pieces, which obviously the, the below ground, um, the worms and everything take it down. It breaks down so well. Um, if it's minus four and above, it still kills the cover crop, but it'll just lie flat. So you still get the kill. But you've laying the cover crop flat where it depends what you're trying to achieve, but to destroy it properly, minus four and below, make sure it's, it's actually frozen the field. I had a lot of people a couple of years ago getting in touch and they were saying, it's worked really well and I've got some really bad wheel marks, but you've got to get the soil frozen first. It's a mistake I made when I first started doing it. I'd get up and get to the field and then get out and I'd have a look and I'd realised that the cover crop was so good, it insulated the soil and the soil hadn't frozen, so it was back to bed. So now I always go to the field first, make sure it's frozen, then I get the tractor out. And this is just a picture showing that same field. I had 95% kill there, and you can't read it very well, but it says who needs glyphosate. And that's what I'm aiming at, is to get away from glyphosate and use, use nature as a natural desiccant to be able to um, destroy cover crops. And that's just a piece in the corner. So you can see how lush the oats were in the cover crop. And it had done a fantastic job on the oats as well. Another way, for some reason the, the video isn't playing, but another way that I do is I have a crimper roller. Um, again, working with Trevor Tapping. We designed the crimper roller working together. Trevor built it for me. And he, he's always a fantastic engineer. Um, so I've got extra veins on the crimper roller to a standard one. What I found on the, the bog standard, the, the sort of rigid ones, one half of the roll would, would be chopping the plant up, the other roll, half of the roll wouldn't be crimping at all. So we developed this one that we've got one metre rolls that undulate to follow the ground. And then I can also set the air pressure on, on the crimper roller. So I can set it really light that you could roll it across your foot and it would just tickle your foot. Or I could set it really heavy that it would break every bone in your foot. So it's, 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 designed for whatever cover crop we're going in, we can get the perfect crimp going up the, up the stem. And that's the, the, the margin that we first used it on. So that didn't have any glyphosate. That was just drilled using the crimper roller, which I was over the moon with that. And then this is me drilling my beans last year and I've got the crimper roller going. The cover crop wasn't the best because we, we hadn't had the, the water the summer before. Um, this year I've got some brilliant cover crops and then the frost done the job for me in November and uh, we got down to minus 12 so it's destroyed all my covers so I won't have to use it this year but it, it does work extremely well. I still had to use a bit of glyphosate last year because the cover crop was so uneven <laughs> but it was a reduced rate which it's still, a, it's still worth doing in my mind to be able to use that reduced rate and that's just showing the plant where I've got four crimps going up the plant so I've cut off the xylem and phloem. So it cut off the blood supply to the plant, basically, and that plant just dies naturally. As long as the plant's a good side, it doesn't regenerate and it works really well. And then I've got a nice patch on top of the soil, soil to protect it, especially in these 
dry spring summers that we've had the last couple of years. Um, natural predators, uh, big on using natural predators. Um, when you walk my fields, especially in the autumn, you'll come out and your boots will be like as if they're covered in snow. Um, and that's just, just for my spiders being on duty and they're on duty 24 seven. Um, and all they want is to be looked after. And again, we're getting a healthy plant vegetation is the exudation to that xylem, is the sap's feeding there. We're having a healthy plant on feeding those predators and, and looking after them for me. So all the, all the good natural predators that I want will be fed and, and on duty for me. And so it's just working in nature and, and keeping away from those um, horrible uh, insecticides that uh, just wipe everything out. And once you use an insecticide, you're just on that treadmill because you've taken out all your predators. So you've just got to keep using them. And uh, it's, I haven't used an insecticide now for eight years. Um, and I, I, I've never regret it and I never go back now. It's uh, it's lovely when I'm out using my spray because I've always got nutrition in there. It smells nice. It, 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 it's a nice job. And occasionally when I do use a herbicide, it's horrible because it smells. It gives me a headache. Um, I just don't want to be using those poisons on my soil. As I said, I do an awful lot of sap testing. So I send my sap tests off to, to Novacrop in, um, in Holland. And I'll be testing every 10 to 14 days. And with the sap test, I, it gives you a little bit more of an insight of what's going on in the plant. So I can start to see any deficiencies developing and react to them before they become a deficiency. Um, so I, I just use sap tests all the while now. I, I don't use any leaf tests at all. Um, I know some people have trouble getting the, the samples over there, but I, I, I only really had a problem at the very start, and that's because I haven't got my paperwork in order for customs. But other than that, it's worked really well. Uh, I also have my own toolkit, so I'll have a pH meter to, to, to keep my own pH. Um, the NO3 I probably don't use as much now with, with the SAP testing. Calcium meter I use an awful lot. My refractometer I use an awful lot. And I play around with redox as well. So uh, I'm always monitoring the crop. And that toolkit just lets me have an insight. If I think there's a problem, I can be there straight away. But I'll be doing that once a week at least to, to, to monitor the plant and to just keep my eye on the health of the plant. I've also got a nitrogen meter. So again, I can just see what's going on within the plant and uh, make sure my yeah, foliar treatments are working and uh, everything's as it should be, really. But um, if I, if I had to choose, it would be the SAP testing I choose over my toolkit now. Um, those testers aren't cheap. Um, and the, the SAP test just gives me all the information I need. I do a lot of my foliar treatments at night. Plants do 80% of their growing between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, if I'm using biology, obviously it's UV sensitive, so I don't want to be putting that out in sunshine. Um, so mates are open at night, so I, I prefer to go at night. I find it quite peaceful at night. The phone stops ringing. And, uh, I can enjoy the job as I used to. So it's, um, it's a really nice experience. And that's how I think I get better absorption of the nutrients um, at night. I also do reverse osmosis on my water. So I'm regenerating, re-energizing my water, which again, I can reduce the amount of uh, nutrition I'm putting on because it just gets absorbed by the plant far, far easier. That's a, a crop of wheat this year. That was a crop of X days. Um, that went on, it averaged 12 tonne to the hectare. It was doing 13 and a half in a lot of the field, but I'd seen it go on the conservative figure. So I had to wait to get a lower one. But that was with um, 50 kilos of soil applied in and then topped up with folias. Um, and that cost me about 82 pound a tonne production for cost. Um, and I'd sold that forward at 280 pounds. So I was really chuffed with that. And so that was no no fungicides, insecticides, anything. That was just, just nutrition, um, which was a real buzz for me because that was the best year we had on the farm. Um, we also did a, a nitrogen trial this time on farm um, with Mike Harrington. And it was quite interesting on the field when we did it on the, where we put uh, ooh, 240 kilos of N. The yield was no higher than where I'd done my, well, my farm standard was, was a little bit higher on that particular field, it was 120 kilos plus foliar M, um, and I got a better yield. So it just shows that the, the high nitrogen doesn't always give you yield, especially when you've got a functioning soil. And that just, just reaffirmed to me that you know what I'm doing is right. 
And it's nice to be able to see when some farmers will say, oh, you need to put more on, you need to be spending more. Well, it obviously proved that I didn't need to spend more last year, which was a well worthwhile trial. I do an awful lot of trials. I think I had 14 trials last summer, last spring. Um, and it's looking like I'll have the same again moving forward. That was another field of X days. Um, that came in at 11 tonne, that was the year before, that was 120 kilo of N. Um, I don't, most of mine are below 120 this year going forward. I still do a couple just as a trial, just to, to I don't know, reassure me that what I'm doing because it's also new. But if everything works to plan this time, then I, I, my highest up soil application will be 40 or 50 kilos. And it will all be foliars now because I've been doing it for five years and I, I think I've proved the point. Some years I get through with no herbicides. Uh, this was a, a, a milling brand of Gruzo and um, Trinity and Nelson. Um, I also I do Gruzo, Trinity, Nelson, Illustrious now. So I like to get that four way blending and get that natural immunity from the crop. But uh, some years I can manage it with no herbicides at all. Planet Spring Barley, that was 20 kilo soil applied and 18 litres of foliar. That was my best yielding barley on the farm. Um, you could ask me why I've now just rolled it out and done it. It's because it's new and because it's not my farm. I, I don't want to just take a risk. So I, I keep doing more every year. And it, this year, I say the barley this year will be all foliar applied. It will all be low end. The wheat, so I have one or two fields at the 120 mark and foliars. But other than that, we... I might not even do that this year because I think I've proved the foliars are the way forward. And obviously by using a foliar, I haven't got the nitrous oxide going out. I haven't got the pollution going into our water. I'll have a lesser carbon footprint, so I've got more carbon to sell. So the whole process is coming together and it's just bringing more incomes to the farm. This was planted spring barley this last year, and that was just grown with organic amino acids. Um, I've done that before um, when I did it probably three years ago, I couldn't roll it out again because it was an expensive trial. It wasn't commercial at the time where now nitrogen's gone up. I can just use amino acids um, and I will be growing barley again, just using amino acids this time. Um, by using amino acids, you don't need anywhere near as much because the plant doesn't need any energy to convert them into proteins. So you, you've saved all that energy um, and it's just keeping a more healthy, balanced plant um, and it'll be a cheaper way of doing it for me moving forward. I also have a bird ringing group come on farm. Um, and since I've been regen farming, the whole farm has come alive again. And we've got all these species coming back. The bird ringing group come out and they come out at night with a thermal image camera and they'll go out and they'll, they'll trap the skylarks and ring them and weigh them and see what's happening. And I'll never forget the first night they came because they came just to show me the cameras and show me what they do. And they started catching and they were so excited because they'd never seen so many birds in all, all the time they'd been ringing. Uh, and they, they just don't go to conventional farms anymore because there's no birds there. It's uh, it's quite ironic that they, they got invited to uh, Winter Watch. Winter Watch wouldn't come here. They made them go down to Gloucester and it was on a conventional farm. And I think they started at six o'clock at night and they didn't find a skylock till four in the morning where if they'd have been here, you know, you can go out and there'll be 80 skylarks on a field and uh, it, there's just nothing not the light. We, we had a, a lesser spotted woodpecker run gear last summer, which was just the highlight of the year for me. But everything is coming back, but it's coming back and, and, and growing in numbers purely because the food source is here. Everything is working as nature intended. I also catch moths for Rothamstead. I think I had 300 different species of moth bought on farm and my moth numbers are, are equivalent to a woodland situation. And uh, I, I remember the email came and I said, Tim, I don't know what you're doing, we'll keep doing it because we've never seen numbers like this. And it just shows once you get everything working, everything comes back. And for like a, a blue tick clutch, we know we'll have eight to 10 in the clutch. They can eat 800 to 1,000 caterpillars a day when they're, when they're working properly. So it's, it's, you need that moth numbers there to have the food source there. But, it's ever since I stopped using insecticides that everything is just thriving on farm now and working in balance with nature as nature intended. And that's me, that's healthy soil, healthy people, healthy planet. Hope I haven't bored you all too much. That was incredible. Thank you very much, Tim.
Danny is still not back, so um, I guess we'll go straight to questions. I'll keep recording. I loved it, and it kind of just confirms everything I've been reading in the Neil Kinsey books, the Arden Anderson books, um, you know, the Don Huber stuff, Datnov Elmer Huber, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, uh, Healthy Crops by Francis, what's his name, Shabusu. So, yeah, like, all of it makes sense. Love the stuff about water-soluble calcium, you know, using the liquid gypsum. Um, you often see huge calcium reserves in soil, but often on the saturated paste test that I use, you you, you don't see a lot of water-soluble calcium. So it's that kind of fire lighter fluid that gets the fire going and gets the structure built, gets the cell walls thickened up. So then they, you know, you've got good balanced structure. Love all the stuff about magnesium, sulfur, boron, molybdenum. So it helps the nitrate flow into amino acids and also just applying amino acids, right? So then um, you can kind of bypass the um, the need for those resources of of maybe some magnesium sulfur and the, you know it's always good to have them there but if you're applying um, the nitrogen as amino acid forms and it saves the plant metabolic energy that's really cool um it, it's exactly the same with silica you, you know you'll see especially the lighter soils silica levels will be there but it's not available and that's what people forget it's yeah that monosilicic acid is crucial right? yeah and the that's salicylic fun. acid not what people uh, maybe think about that but that is a metric that a company that we're looking to use called biomakers use um as a kind of proxy for soil health so the uh, exogenous um production of salicylic acid in the soil is super important and so um yeah good good tool to use i guess if it's uh if you can it's, it's it. fantastic it's the same as jasmonic acid once you start to get that jasmonic pathway which you know by having the salicylic you're going to get more jasmonic but that jasmonic acid just so much for the secondary metabolites and that's that's where we want if we get that plant producing the secondary metabolites it's got its own immune system and defense system tim can you hear me yeah, yes yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys, I, I had a um, family emergency. It's all good. I'm coming back to the farm now. I just got a question about the salicylic acid because um, I read a paper that it actually helps with uh, plant germination, and I was specifically on wheat, actually. Have you experienced that? Thank you. Yes, Def definitely helps with germination. It's such a cheap product. There's nothing not to like about salicylic acid. It's, I use an awful lot of it. Studies just come out with um, hemp cannabis, you know, the salicylic acid, uh, acid helps the plant create loads more secondary metabolites that protect it from attacks from insects and disease and stuff like that. And also results in having higher essential oil contents for people to extract and super useful stuff. It's, it's a wonder product. It's, and to say it's a cheap product, it's, it's derived from willow, you know, it's just aspirin, but it does, you, if you do it in your own garden, which is where I do a lot of my trials, I'll put, try it in the garden first and you spray some on a plant and you'll just see the difference in growth. You'll see the difference, how healthy the plant is. And yeah, why, you know, it's, why would you not use it? That's, that's all I can say. It's cheap and it, it does such a lot. I've been playing around with freeze dried aloe vera powder at home in the garden for that same, that same source of salicylic, well, different source of salicylic acid, same compound, different source. Also love the bit about birds, like coming from South Lincolnshire, I've seen massive decline in, in birds because of agriculture. So very cool data points that maybe some people will forget to, to look at, but I think they're some of the most important data points, to be honest. We've, um, we've bred 14 kestrels on farm. We've bred barn owls. Everything is just, it's just brilliant to, to walk the farm and see the skylarks and you see a kestrel flying. Um, you know, the lesser spotted woodpecker last year, they're so rare and red data, it's just immense. Um, the linnets, the yellow amers, everything is thriving. That's <clears throat> the bird bringing club that, you know, they sort of queue up to come here because they know if they come here, they're going to have a good day catching and, and netting birds and ringing birds. And it's, it's just beautiful to see how the farms change. Uh, going back to your um, whatever it was, acid application, is that relevant for 
um, a grazing farm as much as it is you're talking about for an arable farm? I use it on my grassland again because you just induce the secondary metabolites and it, it um, makes the plant in, um, create its own immune system. It gets everything going. It's also a growth stimulant. It also helps with germination. It's, it's just it's such a cheap product. It's just not worth not having in the mix. And in, in these systems, do you foresee that this is something that you would use on an annual basis? Or is it something that once you get to a level that the system will be self-maintaining? I mean, I, I see our job as facilitating the best that we can, but I'm not sure where the dividing line is between something that we might need to apply every year or we might need to apply every year until we get the system to a certain level. I can't get my head round. I, I think once you've got a sort of totally working, then you probably wouldn't because everything will become available and it will be perfect. But I'm nowhere There's always going to be a yet. limiting factor of something somewhere, though, isn't there? I mean, yeah, you know, um, a lot of a lot of livestock farmers they'll have like dairy farmers they'll have regen ones will have a willow bush growing about as they come out the parlour they'll have a mouthful of willow if they want it because it works so well in livestock as well as it does in in plants you know and I use it to cure a lot of ailments as well it's 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 so good salicylic acid it's you know if you Google it there's so much on it it's unbelievable. Right. And, and microbes, microbes do make it. So yeah, if you were to attain, um, you know, complete soil health, I guess, then it would yeah. come into play. But um, like Tim said, it's a long journey to get to that point. So yeah, supplementing it is probably a good idea to reap the rewards before you get to the point of soil regeneration where it starts to produce its own salicylic acid. I always think you've got to have a plan of where you want to get to, Adam, whether you get there or not. If you're not planning to get somewhere, you're planning to fail in my mind. So I'm always planning that my soil will will just work and I won't have to do anything, but I'm not there yet. But it's monitoring it and observing what's going on. And if you start to see that you don't, for whatever reason, then that's, that's just the, the ultimate goal, isn't it? That's the holy grail in my mind. I'd love to see some of the biomakers' analysis of your soils. That'd be really interesting, maybe... Uh... We can convince Daniel to pay for some in the, in the name of science. That would be good. <laughs> I wanted to say a little bit as well about the water soluble calcium thing. How fun do I keep calcium around in the upper portion of the soil? That's really important. I think maybe um, more water soluble calcium, more calcium in that upper part of the soil where the seedlings start. Um, is a kind of priming effect for the biology in the plants. You know, it kind of mimics the maybe the systems they would be, they would have evolved in, right? So I think that is an important point, not just a nutritional input, but maybe a priming effect for the biology. Yeah, it's like when, when I did it, I'd say that first year, and I, I didn't put any in for, for one section of the field. It, it was just immense to, to see the line, you know, there was less tillers, the plant didn't look as, as well, you know, the roots weren't there. It was, it's an, Once you use it, there's no going back. Liquid gypsum is just a fantastic product. Yeah. You got a um, question no. there from Niels in the chat about the Ava Fertilizer salicylic acid product, if that's the one you use? Yes. It's called Armour, right? Yes. That's the one, yeah. Um... Sorry, I just interrupted someone. Is it Matt? Uh, so, um, yeah, I've got. So the calcium, then, right? Are, are you? If you didn't pull it down, you're short in the sap, are you, Tim? Or are you? Yeah, I would be, yeah, to keep the level up. I want to keep that level up. So, if 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 it wasn't a need, I wouldn't foliar treat, Matt. It's it's just I foliar treat if it's needed. Actually, putting it on the soil, I do like 100 kilos a hectare. Every year over all the farm, because it takes about six weeks for that calcium field to become available. So I try and time it that as the plant is, I know the plant is going to be growing, the calcium will be becoming available. But I'll also put liquid gypsum down so as it's in that rhizosphere right from day one, because calcium is so important in, in my opinion. Is that in a prilled form, the one you put down? The calcium bird's in a prilled form, yes. Is that a calcium fert lime or a calcium fert sulfur product? 
It's just a Kelsey Burton line, Niles. Are you thinking that above the gypsum material, so the Kelsey Burton sulfur? Um, sulfur, I tend to put on it as, as a granular, um, as I'm doing ammonium sulfate, because I'll always use ammonium sulfate as a starting point. I think ammonium sulfate helps stimulate the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So I'll always use ammonium sulfate for that stimulation and get that sulfur there in that way. I have used the calcium third sulfur, um, which, which worked really well, but I've got no problem using it. It's just at the moment I'm using ammonium sulfate to stimulate the biology at the start of the process. Yeah, and no, I'm thinking more of that, the calcium, it's, it's basically a gypsum source, isn't it? So it's fundamentally a calcium source the gypsum sorry yes yeah the gypsum sulfur and calcium yeah yeah so that's calcium for sulfur yes well the, the yeah gypsum gypsum yeah yeah do you, do you look at the source of the gypsum because there's a lot of reclaimed gypsum around right is that something people should worry about contaminants coming in on yeah um, mine's not reclaimed mine's a true gypsum i wouldn't probably use the reclaimed one for that reason madam right good do you mind telling us what the source is? Oh, I'll have to look that one out. And okay, no worries, because I've just been looking for a good source to use with farmers, and I was a bit, yeah, the reclaimed one seemed shady. I, I buy it now through Ava Fertilizers because the guy that used, because it was quite difficult to make, I believe, and the guy that actually made it set up on his own, and I can't remember what his, the name of his company is, but it, it's, it is a really good product. So you don't make it, then you buy it, uh, Tim, the gypsum liquid? No, I buy the gypsum as a liquid because it's difficult to get gypsum and liquefied. I think it's very micronized, but it's not an easy job to do. So I just haven't got enough time Matt, to do everything, so I just buy that. No. And that and that is through Ava as well, is it? Sorry. That's through Ava as well now, yeah. Originally, I just I sourced it, but... Um, like most things I buy, I even started selling it, and it's just easier for me to buy it off them. But... What yeah, I thought was super yeah. interesting was um, you do use some glyphosate sometimes, but your manganese level in your sap was like in the young and the old leaf was way up, right? It was um, actually in the higher, you know, in that in that third column. So that's really interesting. It must uh, you must break it down pretty quick with the biologicals that you use it. What what I do, Adam, I use citric acid and I use formic acid. The citric acid will take the carbonates out of the water so I can reduce the amount of glyphosate I use. I use the formic acid again because the cation exchange of 1100, I can reduce the amount of glyphosate I'm using. But then whenever I'm applying, I'll always apply some molasses with it. And what I believe, the molasses will stimulate the biology. Make, you know, you have a, a microbial bloom, which then eats any glyphosate that's hits the soil in my mind. I haven't proved this. But what I have proved is by testing the water, treated and untreated, where we didn't use the, the molasses and the, all the other products, I'd got glyphosate in the water, but where I, I'd used all the products, I didn't have any glyphosate in the water. So that's that's the way I see it. That's a golden nugget right there. And that's why I think I get away with it, because glyphosate's not nice, but it... It serves a purpose. I'd sooner use glyphosate than move loads of soil. Do you naturally have high levels of manganese in your soils then? Because you don't add a manganese, right? I use foliar manganese. Okay. Um, but um, only only when needed. So in response to the SAP tests? Yes. Yeah. And do you see a dip in the sap after using glyphosate at all, or not really, with your approach? Not with the one method way I'm using it. I wouldn't use it just straight because it's 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 a poison, isn't it? It's, it's I don't yeah. care what anybody says. It's not nice. It's not good for anything. It's not good for us. You know, I I really believe strongly that wheat should never be desiccated with glyphosate and then go into the food system two weeks later. It's just wrong in my mind. Absolutely, yeah. Have you looked into the boric acid material as a sort of as a desiccant? Desiccant. I've done bits, done bits with it, Niles. Um, I've had some successes and some not successes. I think as long as the plant is in senescence, it works really well. But if you've got a growing plant, then it doesn't touch it. But if if you've got oilseed rape that was 
that was, you know, naturally senescing. If you put some boric acid there, it works really well. It speeds up the senescence <laughs> and you're in there. You know, I think that's anybody that wants to get away from using glyphosate on their oil seed rate, that's the answer is use boric acid. But as an actual growing crop, if you wanted to, you know, desiccate a cover crop, then no, it wouldn't, doesn't do the job. Yeah, no. the that's my experience. No, With the not. levels you use, do they, um, does it raise the background level of boron in the soil over time, that practice? Or is it below that I think kind you do, of... Because you've got such a cover of crop, I don't think much of it hits the soil, if I'm honest. I, don't, I suppose the reg residue would, but I'm always short of boron, so that wouldn't really worry me at all. Yeah, um, it seems that I don't think I've ever seen a soil test that doesn't need a little bit of boron, to be honest. No, I haven't. And that's why, you know, I, I think it's a better way of... Oil seed rape is a classic example. It's a better way of desiccating oil seed rape is to use boric acid. Interesting. That's really useful. Yeah. Cool. I think we're ready to wrap up because I have to go soon and Daniel's still not back. But I guess um, any more questions to end on? Guys, if you, if Tim, if Tim, if you have a few more minutes, I'm literally three minutes away from the farm. Adam has to go, but I'll be there. Uh, in three minutes time no problem cool. so i'll just leave you guys chatting away and uh, daniel will be here soon yep thank you so much tim that was that's incredible yeah and it just Thanks, uh, gives me a lot of confidence in the textbook stuff i'm reading and that i could go out work with farmers and uh you know i'm not going to kill everything. it's always reassuring to see it working isn't it a lot of the stuff i do when i haven't seen it working it's always a nerve-wracking time i know exactly where you're coming from Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. More than welcome. Cheers. I was just talking to my dad then, but I've just got one quick question. Um, <clears throat> do, you, do you go by the parameters on the SAP tests and you believe that they're correct or you, do you work them to your own advantage? <clears throat> I, I, I take into effect a lot of what's happening. So if you're in a dry period, and I'd got a lot of calcium in the lower leaves, then I, I probably wouldn't worry too much because the, the, the plant is, is respiring a lot. The water is going down to those lower plants, so it's, it takes the calcium with it, as I, I believe. So it, it's taking all the environmental factors as well, Matt. So I couldn't just say one particular thing. I, when I get my subtests back, I sit down and look and look at what's happening, and I do a, a detailed analysis for myself. It's... Um, I, I wouldn't be able to talk you through just sitting here, you know. No, I, I know, and, and this is what we need to learn, big sir. But um, do you think the nitrogen um, parameters are correct? Um, I know that it's it's the devil and all the rest of it, but we are foliar feeding. But um, in some instances, this last season, um, although we did well, we we probably didn't do as well as we should have done, really. That's that's interesting. Mine last year, where I'd foliar fed, out yielded my soil fed crops for, for want of a better phrase, drastically. The bushel was higher, the, the, the plant was healthier. It worked really, really well. Um, and I think it, uh, nothing grows without water, and I think you have to take that into account. And I think we're still learning with the sap tests. Um, and we, you know, we've got an awful lot to learn. So, I think it's the nitrogen one, especially. You know, you all of a sudden you get a shower of rain and biology starts working again. I, I think you know the nitrogen jumps up personally, um, and I think yeah. that's one. You, it's where you've got to take your own farmer experience into account, Matt, and and make a a, 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 a grounded judgment rather than just making a judgment off the sub test. Yeah, I know, absolutely. So, we, yeah, yeah. We're just, um, yeah, exactly what you just said. It won't grow without water, but yeah, all our sap said we're all right. Um, and we just kept it, you know, dribble feeding it. That, uh, that's where that lots test that Mike Carrington did here last year was really interesting because where he got 240 kilos of N, it didn't yield any higher than what I'd done with, with 120 kilos of N. And that, that was really reassuring to me because to see that actual trial and see that high amount of N, when you know, people are saying, oh, you, you know, you've had a better yield, we've used IN, where people I trust that I phoned last year, phoned round just to see what their yields were like, and mine were better. And, you know, I wouldn't, some people, I just don't trust to ask them because they're always fantastic yields, if you know what I mean. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. Where, uh, <laughs> people yeah. that I actually trust, I phone round, and their yields were similar, or, or you know, they were no better or worse than mine. You know, and having that nitrogen trial on farm, where Mike had used we'd used two hundred and forty kilos of N against my hundred and twenty, and it was the same year, oh, was oh, really reassuring because yeah. I haven't burnt all that carbon out, I haven't done all that damage to the to the, my soil, and I've got the same yield. So that to me was a positive on its own. The weather oh, let us oh. down to for a lot of the trial, but that one made the trial worthwhile on its own, in my mind. Are you Sorry, thinking Tim. two or three times as much then uh, through the leaf? Could you repeat that, Matt? Sorry, I didn't catch that. So, so you're working on, so if you're going to put nitrogen through the leaf, you're working on um, equivalent to soil applied, two or three times as much? Three times as much. I think we could probably go up to five. I think three is probably too conservative well, if I'm honest, Matt, but it's still a work in progress. But I think it'll yeah. probably be five if I'm totally honest. So, so where are you looking then when you calculate it all out? Are you working at 220? So if you're if you're going to put uh, 50 kgs on and you're saying it's two times as much, that's 100 kgs compared to soil applied. Where are you thinking a top yield, healthy plant amount of nitrogen you need for putting on and we're working at 220 or a bit of a funny question you know just to watch you i'd like i'd probably like to to, to in my head as a, as a layman farmer i'd like to get it up to the equivalent of 180 kilos of soil applied in. and then if it's a million yeah. weight i'll go in with an amino acid to try and get the protein up at the very end um so yeah. i think combining the amide end with um, amino acids is the way forward. So we've got the amino acids and we've got that that amide end, the the AVA fertilizer. I think combining the two together is, is just the perfect example because we've got all the amino acids there, and I think a little bit of the the amide end. I think it's worked brilliantly well. And that's in Nichiramin, then, is it? Um, it's it's the Citadel as well. It's more the Citadel these days that I use instead of Nichiramin. I think your uh, comment about having functional soils is uh, obviously very valid because uh, I did a trial uh, with Nichiramin trying to, um, and the crop really didn't have anything except for Nichiramin to build the N up, and uh, <laughs> it didn't do very well. But I think, to be honest, we were in a conventional stage at that time, and uh, we just didn't, yeah, there's nothing functioning there, and you're just relying on an idea. It's why I always emphasize the point because I've had people come here and they say, Oh, I stopped using fungicides last year. It cost me two tons to the hectare. And I said, Well, what else did you do? Nothing. Said, come okay. on. Yeah. I'm working yeah. five times as hard as it to be able to not use fungicides. It's, yeah. it's people just take a snippet of the information, which is why I always try and emphasize when I'm giving a talk that you've got to earn the right to do what I do. You can't just go cold yeah. turkey. Yeah, that's it. Well, that was very interesting. I'm going to have to go, but yeah, that was ace. Thank you, Tim. More than welcome. Good to see you, man. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Niels, if you're still... Uh, Daniel, Neil, anybody else? Lovely. <laughs> yeah, in terms of cold turkey, we, we do cold turkey, you know? We do cold turkey so you don't have to. But you, you're not doing cold turkey, are you, Daniel? You're doing an awful lot to be able to do cold turkey. That's how I would see it. You're not doing nothing, which is a massive difference. In terms of in terms of the efficiency of, of inputs, um, what Matt said is actually quite interesting because you know if if he's applying something similar to what you've applied and had a completely different result, right? And then uh, you've been obviously doing this for up to years, and and he's doing this straight under a conventional system after a conventional system. Um, we've been talking a lot here actually inside our lab about using compost, using using microbes as a as a vessel basically, and. We're, you know, down down the line in terms of our development, we'll be uh, testing ways of um, of incorporating things which may be missing in the soil in a in a sort of like a designer compost. Is that something that crossed your mind? Something that you've played with? Um, it's certainly something that's crossed my mind. I haven't played with it. I, I you know, I just roared with the compost. So I just play around with compost. I, I know compost has got all the answers, Daniel. It's just finding the ultimate one and I don't know what that is you know it's it's just beyond your environment but I enjoy playing around with compost and I just think compost has got all the answers it's, uh, you, you know this I, is I this know is... there was um, Frederick Thomas spoke at base I heard and 
he was saying that composting manure was a waste of time, that you lose too much nitrogen. And I was just like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Just me. Oh, yeah. Um, part, part of me wants to ask, I mean, I, I did a trial, I mean, we're livestock and I, we've got, We've got a mixed lay that we put in after a rape kale hybrid, and I did a third, well, a, a quarter, no, yeah, a quarter of the field with uh, John's with uh, some of Don, Daniel and Adams Johnson Sioux treat, seed treatment, another quarter with um, a just some of my own compost seed treatment, and then the third quarter with nothing, and then the end rigs around the outside of the field was just completely separate and there was a considerable I, I had long COVID last summer and I didn't get to do all that I wanted to do it just wasn't fit for it but there was a significant difference with the water retain the soil um attachment to the roots on the three different plots a, a really um seven percent more soil in the um, in my own compost one and 16% more soil attached to the roots than in the uh, the um, the what do you call it control one but I mean if you've got that difference in that part of your soil the, the difference in that also in the soil structure must also be the water retention and in a year like last year in your part of the world that has to count for a lot definitely yeah definitely my Crops will always be the last to start and show drought stress. Yeah. Because around here, because soils are like flag leaves or curl, they'll go like knitting needles. And mine are always the last ones. And it's just getting that carbon content up yeah. in the soil. Yeah. I'm, I'm increasing soil organic matters by about 0.2% per annum. But it's always at different levels in the stratosphere. So sometimes it can be the top 10 or the top 20 or the top 30. It's um, it's never always in the top area. So it's, it's just mm. nice. And when mm. people say, you know, you'll get to the point you can't sequester any more carbon, I just don't believe that. It'll just go deep. No, 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 no. Because to me, nature built topsoils that were 5, 10, 15 foot deep across the plains of the world. So who there is a limit as to the percentage of, carbon in the soil but there's no limit to the depth of that soil and we actually learned that so I after had, uh, after how after so many years tim if if i poke this what do you what do you see because i'm sure you use one of those it would just go down to the floor are yeah. you are you sitting on something i mean how deep are your soil? because for instance here we we, we sit on sometimes on, on calcium outcrops and so like the minimum soil is like 30 centimeters we, so we like we that's we, my max. We're about 12, 14 inches. It's, it's growing, obviously. But the one thing I had to, when I do a big presentation, I've got another slide where I had a drain block. And it was one of the best drains I ever had blocked. I was drilling the field and I could see the drain blocks. I thought, I've got to get the digger and repair that. It's going to annoy me all summer. And I dug down to 1.2 meters and the archaic worms were going down 1.2 meters and they were going deeper. And it was just a black line of carbon going down which is why the whole profile will just keep improving as you get more and more worm numbers and everything will be working. It's, yeah. it's just always been building and working. It's just that I've got this mentality that it, it won't get any better and, you know, it won't keep improving. Of course it will. Yeah, I, I, totally I, was, agree. I was at an NFU thing in, uh, in Dumfries uh, November time and sitting next to the ex-president, Andrew Mc, whatever his name is, and he was saying, oh, but there's a limit to the amount of carbon you can put in the soil. And I said, Andrew, there is a limit to the percentage, but there's no li limit to the depth. And his eyes just popped to his head. You know, <laughs> just said, you know. <laughs> there, is a, there is a bit of an epidemic, Judith, in terms of, you know, like people repeating things. So, you know, we, we have to be careful about basically, you know, how how this whole conversation is, is structured. I think that the most, most important part in all of this is evidence and you know having a person like tim uh, around to um to to, to show yeah. that you know with a bit of an effort bit um you know after after a number of years basically you know you you can actually turn things about and and, and also make it a, into a profitable venture and something that's going to be sustainable right mm. so even even you know if um if if our moonshot is not yet you know at the door basically there's there's things that we can do 
to um to 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 make it to make it work and and all that rhetoric about you know <laughs> that you can only put so much and then then I hear people talking about oh you know but it's gonna go away it's like yeah it's a dynamic system it goes up it goes down it goes up it goes down you just have to make sure that basically it's a system that supports going in more than than just going out and well, you know as as long as you've got that then you don't we don't worry about the fact that this is in the cycle. Yeah, but what Tim's saying is that he's got a huge amount more life on the farm. And mm. our job in sequestering carbon is not necessarily sequestering it in long term, sequestering stuff no. that doesn't move out the soil. It's just moving that carbon away from the atmosphere to other parts of the carbon cycle. And every insect, every moth, every bird, every animal that's on that farm that wasn't on there before is keeping carbon away from the atmosphere. So it's doing the same job. So Judith, we... that's that's a, that's a great that's a great thought actually because you know I, I couldn't hear everything when I was in the car but Tim you were saying that you're doing uh, counts of of moths and stuff for us I'm yeah. uh, next time weigh it for me why <laughs> just just weigh it basically and um and then we we do per per hectare basically um uh, you know carbon sequestration in uh, in moths. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll sell the carbon credits myself okay <laughs> but actually these guys that are trying to do get farmers to do carbon audits need to understand that that's all part of it it's it's the life within and without as well as the long term in inverted commas carbon that, that is important it's the whole thing it's the whole cycle it's not just that bit that is longer term carbon in the soil it's everything yeah, people don't understand it, and that's why basically no after idea. speaking, that's yeah. why that's why after you know a number of times after speaking for two hours about soil biology, the the question that's inadvertently asked is, have you used biochar? <laughs> that's basically the question that we that we that we always get asked, and because because char is is something that people can believe. Oh, you know, it's 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 calcitrant. You know, it's it's not something that basically you know it's it's accessible to to get. You know, blown off into the atmosphere. They they believe that this is the only solution. But um, I think I think that you know, hopefully the rhetoric is changing, and and we we are getting more and more understanding that it's it's a dynamic system, and mm. and the biosphere is is living, and the whole thing is is alive, and and it's it's just a cycle that we're in. We just need to make sure that the sink is is greater than the uh, than the outpour. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I, you know, I couldn't hear obviously the, the whole conversation, but I hope um, uh, since since we since we did advertise this as, a, as an all seed rape um, session, uh, there was there was one thing that I was hearing about the. Um, I think there was a student uh, that looked at um, your all seed rape planting after the uh, the, the barley. So did you did you say they catch it right that you actually had a population of flea beetle uh, in that barley? The, the flea beetle in the barley was immense. The, they they came in on the through the combine and were in the grain store and they were marching out. And when I was drilling the all seed rape, the floor was moving with flea beetle. And even I thought this is going to be the biggest test I've ever done for my theory and system, and it worked absolutely fine. How how big was the field? Oh, it was all the fields, so it was 150 acre. There we go. That's a very interesting. One Sorry, Charles, you've got a question. Acre. Number of fields, I think. Char Charles, you had a question. No? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Yes, 150 acres, you were saying. In total, it would have been three or four fields, yeah. I don't know why the flea beetle were in the barley, but they were. And so the floor was moving. It was... And did they did they basically were they were they um did did you look at sort of the, the the structure of of the of the plants because you you were saying that this was the population was there very close to harvest of the of the barley so what they were feeding on at that time don't know because the, obviously the barley was internecine so I don't know what they were feeding on Daniel I, I don't, can't answer that one so do you think do you think because these are adults so these are adults which are basically in a reproductive stage right so these are not the larval stage which would be actually feeding these so were where were the larvae were they just basically sitting in the soil in in that part of the cycle don't know I haven't got the answer to that one okay. so I've never seen flea beetle like it and they say I I was a little bit concerned with the amount that was there and I thought well this is Either going to prove me or, or break me, and it, it what was the me. what was the, what was the crop before before it, it was spring barley, right? 
So spring barley. Did you, sorry, have, would have, did you been, have a cover crop before that? It would have had a cover crop and it would have had winter wheat before that. Okay, so winter wheat into cover crop into spring barley. So there was there was no there was no oilseed rape, you know, uh, for more than a year, basically uh, two years, basically at least, right, in that field. Yeah, can I? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Charles. Oh, right, okay. Um, so what were the timings, Tim? Um, because I had similar. I've had crop failures with uh, cabbage stem flea beetle, but the last time I grew a crop, I planted it very early. And uh, I, I, I maintain that the, the advantage was that the plants got established with true leaves before the uh, cabbage stem flea beetle uh, came in, because there appears to me to be a time from when they are coming from the fields, from the crops, they've finished with the rape. And then there's, there's a period of time when they seem to get themselves together of about a fortnight or so before they then move back into the fields uh, to start eating uh, the, the, and laying their eggs and things. And um, I, although I got an attack, um, it was fairly minor and the plants just shrugged it off. And later on, they got very big stems. And although larvae did in actual fact inhabit them, the stems were too big. And um, you're talking about 50, 60 mil across some of them. Uh, and the, the, there wasn't all that much in the way of attack, but they, they just they just weren't um, significant. So um, I thought it was timing myself. That particular year, the Aussie rate was drilled on the 10th of September. Oh, right. OK. Because some people dodge it by going really late, don't they? Do dodge the timings. <clears throat> I'm always limited, Charles, by, by the spring barley. So it's whenever I get the spring barley up. So yeah. this year was I, I drilled the last week of August, I think. But uh, that particularly, I mean, I have been 15th of September. It's uh, but it, it's normally around that 10th when I when I drill, um, and that's that's when I was drilling that particular. So year. you're 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 sort of towards the latter end of the of the bad attack period, anyway. Then aren't you in September? Later on in September, I suppose never. Concerns me because I yeah. know if I get the nutrition right, I won't have a problem. Yeah. Okay. And then going back to that, that cover crop prior to spring barley, um, did you have brassicas in that mix? No, it would have been beans and vetch and rice. Okay, beans and vetch and rice. Okay, fine. One one other question about cover crops. Um, so they seem to be pivotal um, to, especially the the initial phases of regenerative farming on an arable farm, because it's allowing us to grow stuff and variety of stuff all year round. Um, I found this year with the drought that I had difficulty establishing good cover crops in some places, especially after spring crops, uh, it was quite thin. Do you, do you have a, a, I mean, you might, you, you might not have witnessed this, but do you have a strategy for this? Or do you see this as being a potential problem for regenerative uh, practices, cover cropping? Last last year, I waited till there was some rain forecast, and then I got um, got my cover crops in mid August. But I got a nice shit, and then they sat there, and they didn't really get going again then until the latter part of September. And then because we had that lovely October and we had rain, I'd got cover crops that were yeah, they were four or five feet tall. They were brilliant, and mm. I went right into December. I'd got some flowers flowering first week of December, and then the frost came. And that minus twelve just just decimated them. They just went very quickly. Mm, mm, mm. You you you're quite confident you're always going to be able to establish them. Okay, you're covered. It's it's as the soils improved, everything's improved along with it. So right, yeah, I, I get okay, better yeah. germination. I get better cover crops. You know when yeah. I'm drilling now because the the top of the soil is just a complete mass of worm cast. So I I always see you know, always. Um, Managed to cover the cover the seed trench up, you know, the, the seed trench is covered. I never have open trenches anymore. The, the, the seed trench is covered because I've got so many worm casts there that it's it's just so friable on the top. It's just a dream and just keep it just, just keep getting better and better, Charles. It just doesn't okay. yeah. Which you know, everything just keeps improving because the whole system is cycling better. So the cover crops are cycling better. The biology is better in the soil. Everything is just moving forward. Do you remember? Do you remember which year was it where you actually put in your first cover crop in? Two thousand and fifteen. Two thousand and fifteen. How did it look like? No, no, it wasn't. 
It would have been 2013, sorry. Okay, what did it look, how did it look like? Um, it wasn't anything special. It was, um, I think I just used oats as my very first cover crop and yeah, they didn't amount to much. And then the very first year, I can't remember. They they were all right. They were good cover crops. What was it? What the, was very first, like? the very first year, it was an exceptional cover crop, actually, thinking about it, because I was in the mid-tier, and at the time in the mid-tier, I could only destroy it by mechanical means, and there was no way I was going to bloody plough it, which is where I came up with the idea of rolling on the frost, because I was determined I wasn't going to bloody do any cultivations. So I, I just saw the frost, and I thought they should work. And I went out there at three o'clock in the morning. Um, the rolls wouldn't unfold because the oil was so cold in the tractor. And I just sat there and I thought, what the bloody hell am I doing? And uh, the event, I had a cup of coffee and the, the oil got warm and then I managed to unfold the rolls and I rolled the field and I didn't know whether it was going to work or not. And a couple of days after, it just worked absolute treat. I'd got 90% kill. It was a fantastic reward for, for taking the, the initiative and having a go. What was the what was the soil like when you when you first drilled that first cover crop? Uh, when I first started direct drilling, I, I had problem covering the slots up because there's, I probably had eighty percent, and it didn't worry me because the John Deere drill because it's got the seed firming wheel. You always get good seed to soil contact, so as long as anything doesn't drop in the trench and start eating the seed, it will always grow. Where now I get probably ninety eight to hundred percent slot closure because the soil is so friable. So, but the, the reason I'm asking this question is because, you know, you're, you, you're, at, a, you're at a point in your journey where um, some people would look at it and it's like, oh gosh, darn it, it's so easy for him. I'd like to, um, I'd like to have that, you know, easy situation, but I've got ter terrible soil. I won't be able to do anything. But then the, 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 que the point of that question is, you know, is that, that there was a point in time where it wasn't like that. No, oh God, no. I took some land on probably six years ago now that was came straight out of a conventional system. And there was a couple of headlands where the soil was so bad, I drilled them twice to try and get a crop there because they just wouldn't grow. They were so anaerobic. I lifted them and then we had very heavy rain and they went straight back down and I had to re-drill them because they, that's how bad they were. But now they're, they're functioning, they're thriving. And that's turned around in, in six, seven years. How how important are cover crops for your system? They're vital. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to do what I do without cover crops, in my opinion. Cover crops that they do all my cultivating, they're feeding that biology. And I try to have at least an 11 species mix. So plants put out the different exudates and feeding different biology and the symbiosis between plants. I always think the cover crops are the, the key to what I do. Where do you buy your mixes? Most of mine come from Frontier. Frontier. I used, to, I used to buy cheap mixes, but I didn't have as good germination with cheaper mixes. So I just once I started buying off, off Frontier, I, I've never had a problem. I've always had good cover crops. So it's, I work well with Jim Egan, so it works really well for me. Charles, go ahead. Uh, just on the spots we're talking about cover crops, um, it's been my observation that it's a good idea to have um, spring and winter um, versions of each crop you're growing. For instance, spring linseed, winter linseed, um, because during the, during the growing cycle, especially if you're grazing, um, you find that you've got different kind of crop in November. So if you've got spring crops, you'll get a lot of leaf in, in November, which is good for, say, feeding a sheep on. But when you get into later on, like you had with the bad frost in December, then they die out. And it helps if you've got a, a winter variety in there. Same, same with virtually everything is, do you do that? Try to, so I'm always trying to keep a soil covered, Charles. So I'll, in my mix, I'll probably have some oats in there. So like this time, the, the frost has taken the cover crop, but the oats have kept that understory, so it's still green. I've still got all my soil yeah. covered. The same with the beans and veg, where I'm just trying to um, get more nitrogen into the soil, ready for the spring barley to be able to reduce the, the nitrogen. I put rye in there. So if the beans and the veg get killed off by the frost, as I have done, the rye keeps it going, and I've still got that green understory. So the soil is always covered and covering all the bases. Right. I think I think we've gone over quite a bit. 
any more questions before we wrap up because i don't want to be you know we i'm, I'm sure we could we could chat all night um tim tim is up for it i mean tim is going to be sitting here no problem he's like yeah I've, I've got the time you know i love you guys and this is what tim is thinking right now but um but we have to let him go so any more questions before we wrap up yeah how do you fill the time between now and three o'clock in the morning when you're going to go out and spray or roll <laughs> Only reading books, Niles, as you well know. <laughs> Any more? No. No, right, that well, Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I wasn't I wasn't there for most of it, but um, I will be reviewing the um, the recording myself so I can listen to um, to you again. I look forward to, um, to to chatting with you in person. Either you know, go up to your farm, you come down to us, or we meet at Grantsville. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Be great. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.